Hi, my name's Drew, and I'm going to be walking you through the Lance 650 today. Uh, starting right up front here, uh, we're going to note the uh, jacks on all four corners. Now, that is the Happy Jack remote system. Uh, what that means for you is that these are wirelessly controlled. Uh, we're going to touch more, uh, we're going to focus more on that uh, here in just a few. Uh, but while we're here at the front jack, I do want to point out that manual operation procedure. Uh, if you go ahead and remove this cover here, and you go ahead and disengage the motor. Uh, what you're going to find on the inside is a large crank handle that's going to allow you to uh, manipulate these jacks manually. Of course, that's going to be an emergency only scenario, a, a complete power loss scenario, things like that. Uh, it's going to take you three times the amount of time to load it or unload it. Um, so not something you're going to want to make a habit of doing, uh, but it is very nice to have the option. Um, of course, once you're finished, go ahead and um, return that into that position uh, and uh, you know go ahead and place this cap here. Uh, moving on we have your on-demand water heater here or tankless water heater. Uh, this is an excellent uh, feature. It gives you a quote-unquote endless supply uh, of hot water or on-demand. Uh, to turn the unit on is going to be this switch right here. Uh, so we turn that on. We are going to have a display on the inside that's going to give us a real-time readout of temperatures uh, and, and allow us to adjust that temperature. Um, for that display to work on the inside, this switch does need to be in the on position. So, uh, Also, these units themselves are very susceptible to uh, freeze damage. Uh, so you have a couple of options uh, when it does come to winterization or, or if you think that you may be encountering uh, cold weather. Uh, one of them is if you have the unit plugged in, you have the propane on, things like that, you turn the unit on. Uh, as long as it is operating properly, it has an antifreeze mode, which is going to kick on and heat the water just ever so slightly to keep it from freezing. Uh, if, you are, if you don't have uh, that option, uh, then it's going to be my recommendation that you do uh, a full winterization uh, on the unit which is going to be purging all the water from the system uh, and replacing with an RV grade antifreeze. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we move on uh, but it is very important that you either do one of those two things uh, because again there's a lot of a lot of brass and a lot of copper within this unit uh, which again makes it very susceptible to freeze damage. So. Uh, moving on here we have your furnace uh, this is your propane burning furnace with direct spark ignition. Uh, what we see here is going to be your exhaust. Uh, now this is not what you would consider a customer serviceable unit. Uh, what that means for you is there's just not going to be very much maintenance with it, not much that you can do as a consumer, uh, especially here on the outside. Uh, what this is is an exhaust. We're going to let it exhaust, make sure you're not restricting that flow. Uh, other than that, uh, this tends to be a large intrusion point for mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, they like to crawl within the unit and nest as far uh, within the appliance as they can. So uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to use an uh, aftermarket uh, bug screen and we're going to place that over that vent. Uh, that is, of course, going to not restrict the flow at all, uh, but it is going to go ahead and protect it, again, from mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, beside that, we have your potable water fill. Uh, this is how we're going to fill the onboard water tank. We're going to stick a drinking water hose uh, directly in here. We're going to fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once we are full, we cap it off. We do use that onboard uh, built-in 12-volt water pump to go ahead and pressurize that, draw that water up to the fixtures and make it usable. Uh, this is going to be your boondocking or your off-grid option, um, and uh, it will work as such. So before where you're going, uh, go ahead and, and make sure you have access to water. You can go ahead and fill that up. Uh, beside that, we have your outside shower, access to hot and cold water here, uh, pull out uh, sprayer here. Sprayer does have a hard on off switch on the fixture. Uh, what I've seen happen is that since people don't constantly see water here at the fixture, uh, they do forget they have these valves on. They go ahead and feed this up there into the cabinetry. Uh, put that in, in place. And as you can see, that on-off switch is uh, orientated towards the door. Um, you can inadvertently turn that on. So, so just make sure that you do have these, these valves, in fact, in the closed position. Uh, that's going to, of course, keep you from making that mistake. 
Uh, we have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. Now this only does plug into the unit one way. If I go ahead and remove the plug, uh, we can go ahead and look at the receptacle. We have one L-shaped uh, slot there and we have an L-shaped prong there. If we go ahead and line them up and plug it straight in, uh, we're gonna give it an eighth inch turn to the right that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here we're gonna screw down and lock in further. It's gonna keep anybody from potentially uh, tripping on it from it to uh, potentially uh, coming prematurely disengaged. Uh, it's going to be my recommendation for every single unit that I deliver that you go ahead and add a 30 amp 110 volt surge protector uh, in line with the unit. So what that would look like is that's going to plug directly into the power source, of course your cord in line with the unit, uh, and then making this connection here. Uh, there's a lot going on in these units electronically, a lot of sensitive electronics. Uh, you are very susceptible to not only surges, uh, substandard wiring, uh, dirty wiring, things like that. Uh, the only thing you can do to 100% protect yourself is going to be the addition of a surge protector. If you have any questions on which products to use or further, uh, further how to use those products, uh, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to go ahead and walk you through that. Uh, dropping down low here, uh, we have some water connections. Uh, this white one here is going to be your city water connection. Uh, that's what you're going to use if you have access to full-time running water or you are in the capacity of a RV park. It's going to be this guy here. Uh, when we talk about city water, it's very important that we do talk about pressure. Now these units are rated for a working water pressure between 40 and 75 psi. Uh, what that means for you is that you always, always, always need to use a water pressure regulator. Uh, we include one with your purchase. This is going to go ahead and regulate that water pressure uh, to in between 40 and 50 PSI. Uh, if that, for whatever reason, is not enough water pressure, feel free to upgrade to either an adjustable water pressure regulator or a high flow water pressure regulator. Uh, either way, uh, whichever you choose, they're going to hook directly onto the water source and then your hose onto that. And then lastly, the trailer connection is going to be rotated as you uh, attach it here, so something like that. Uh, beside that, we have your black tank uh, flush there. Now that fitting there uh, corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank. It is specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, it's very important that you use that properly. Uh, Reason being is there is no check valve. There's, there's nothing to really keep that wastewater within the tank if you were to overflow it. Uh, so what that means is that the path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents. Uh, again, if water is left in there too long or left rushing into the tank too long, uh, it will eventually come out of those rooftop septic vents. So uh, what I recommend my customers is going to be, uh, when utilizing this, go ahead and make sure you're also utilizing the uh, tank monitor system there on the inside. Uh, fill this up, let water rush in there as you're monitoring that level. When that tank gets to be about two thirds full, go ahead and relieve the pressure there on the backside. Again, very, very important that you use that properly. It's an excellent feature as long as it is used properly. Uh, and it's gonna be my recommendation to go ahead and do that at every chance you get or every single time you dump. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, taking a look down here, making sure we're not missing anything. Uh, and it looks like we're clear, uh, so we're going to move on. Uh, we have a, st a, storage, a storage compartment here. Um, you know, nothing too crazy. Of course, it's not very big. Uh, coming here to the back side, uh, we have uh, your sewage hose storage. Uh, now, we can see kind of the actual tubing in that compartment, but this is where you're going to store your sewage hose. It is just a a secondary compartment that, that keeps this segregated from all of your other stuff uh, and it will work well with most sewage hoses. Uh, you may have problems in terms of length because it is only about two and a half feet long. So, uh, But will work well with the sewage hose that is provided for you. Uh, also here on the back side, uh, up high we have your docking lights, we have your uh, marker lights. Uh, coming down low, we have tail lights, things like that, uh, license plate lights. Uh, underneath this white, white cover there, we have your cable satellite inlet. Uh, some higher end campgrounds will offer a park cable service and just about every satellite provider is offering a package geared towards RVers. 
This would be the inlet of those services. Again, those are standard RG6 cable fittings. Those are just gonna pass through, the, pass through to the designated TV area of the camper. And then beside that, we have a couple 110 volt all weather outlets. Just some standard 15 amp outlets that uh, would allow you to power some of those appliances here on the backside of the unit. Uh, if I come down low here, uh, go ahead and open up um, this compartment here. Uh, we have your gray and your black water fitting. So, so black water is gonna be anything that comes from the toilet. So what we're looking at uh, body waste as well as toilet paper, uh, things of that nature are going to come or be considered black water. Uh, gray water is going to be sink water, shower water, the red, relatively cleaner of the two. Uh, it is very important that these are used properly. So black water in particular is going to spend 90% of its life in the closed position. You're again going to use that monitor panel on the inside and only dump as necessary. Uh, two scenarios, either dump as it fills up or dump before changing location. So it's going to be my recommendation that you don't carry your, that you don't carry your uh, sewage with you. So uh, again, keep those in the closed position. Uh, it's very important that we, um, you know, only have one open at one time. So we want to avoid any cross-contamination issues, things like that. A popular option is going to be go ahead and dumping that black water and then using the gray water to chase. Of course, closing the black water first and then opening up that gray water to help rinse those lines uh, on the those lines on the way out and your sewage hose here. Uh, in between the two, you have a bayonet style fitting. Uh, that cap needs to be in place at all times while traveling uh, and uh, is going to connect and disconnect the very same way your sewage hose does. So you have uh, four prongs along the outside of that fitting. We're gonna put the keyhole of either the cap or the sewage hose in the halfway position. We're gonna give it a quarter turn that's gonna go ahead and lock it on. All right, so here uh, we have your keyless entry. Uh, this is gonna be a RVLock.com product. Uh, when you take delivery of the unit, your code is going to be 1234. Uh, of course, then lock, that's going to go ahead and actuate the deadbolt. Uh, and then of course, 1234 unlock. Uh, this unit itself runs on four AA batteries. Uh, the, the unit itself is pretty good at alerting you when those batteries get low. Um, you would then remove these two screws to go ahead and change out those batteries. It's an excellent, excellent product. Uh, does also come with a, a, a uh, key fob, you know, like your vehicle would, uh, and it works well. Uh, now, with all of that being said, uh, it's not something that I would necessarily bet my lunch on. I would not um, not have a spare key somewhere either in my tow vehicle or, you know, a hide a key on the outside or something. Uh, just because it's, being that it's battery ran, um, it would take a lot of trust uh, to, to have this as my, my standalone uh, entry door lock. So to take that for what you will, uh, that's just my opinion on it. Uh, we have a standard assist handrail here, uh, going to lock in the out position, uh, easily fold it against the door if you wish, or some people like to fold it against the body, uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, there's no right or wrongs there. Uh, we have your propane compartment here. Uh, now what they use here is a two-way 20-pound propane tank. That means that it can be uh, operated in this sideway position, uh, but it is going to be filled in the standard up and down position. Uh, works well, has a gauge, uh, still operates, you know, as you would, would with a traditional propane cylinder open and close valve on the top. Now to remove the tank, we have a thumb screw here. We just go ahead and loosen that thumb screw. And then we swing this bracket out of the way. That's going to allow us to go ahead and pull that tank out, of course, once we've disconnected your propane pigtail here. Uh, very easy. Uh, you're gonna be stuck with this tank, essentially. So, uh, you know, you're not gonna be eligible for any exchange programs, things like that. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, you know, the accessibility of propane is gonna make that, uh, you know, very usable and easy to find there on the road. Coming around here uh, to the passenger side of the unit, uh, of course we have the awning in the out position, uh, so you can see that. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and talk about that further on the inside, the controls. This is a carefree, uh, one-touch awning. Uh, works really well, gives you a, a wind protection as well, uh, but we're again gonna talk about that further there on the inside of the unit. 
Uh, also on this side, we of course have your speakers, your outside speakers. Uh, they make this a very usable space with the awning and the speakers, uh, porch light, things like that. We're gonna get to all of that stuff there on the inside. Just gonna poke my head down here, make sure we're not missing anything. And we do have a, if you wanna kinda of switch me places here, we do have a, a propane line here. Uh, now this is a, a, a quick disconnect coupler, uh, which is going to accommodate any high flow propane appliance with that corresponding uh, quick connect fitting on the end. Uh, what that means for you is you can hook up a gas grill here, you can hook up a propane fire pit, propane heater, all of those high flow propane appliances uh, will work well with this. Uh, you just slide back the locking collar, insert the mail in. Uh, if you, excuse me, go a little further up, you're gonna see a valve. Uh, we just turn that valve in line and at that point that propane is flowing through the line. Now you cannot connect or disconnect with the, uh, the valve here in the on position. Uh, it's a secondary safety feature so you do have to go ahead and slide that valve into the correct position before you can go ahead and unlock the collar there. Uh, when going down the road or not in use, make sure you put the desk cap uh, back in place. That's gonna keep any road debris uh, from accumulating in the fitting there. Uh, hopping up here to your refrigerator vent. Uh, now this is your refrigerator. Um, works well, this is I believe a three-way refrigerator. Uh, what that means is it runs on 110 volt electricity it runs on propane gas as well as uh, 12 volt, uh, igni 12 volt as well. Uh, works well on all of those features. We're gonna talk about more of the operation side of things on the inside, uh, but here on the outside, it's uh, important to note uh, that we do need to go ahead and screen these openings off. That's gonna keep any mud daubers, flying insects from nesting within the appliance. Um, other than that, we're gonna go ahead and remove this vent a couple times a year. Uh, make sure nothing's made its way into the unit. Make sure we don't have any nesting uh, issues. Give it a visual inspection. See it. Make sure you don't have any, you know, frayed wires, uh, cracked propane lines, things like that. Uh, if you go ahead and do those things, uh, should be relatively stay in relatively good shape. Uh, also, we want to make sure that when we are replacing that vent there, that we do go ahead and uh, route that in the correct place. Uh, if you can see, there's some cutouts here. Uh, on the vent, we're just going to go ahead and place the hose in there. We go, we go ahead and put the tabs up top and seat these into the correct location and give them a quarter turn that's going to go ahead and lock it on. I always go back after the fact and give it a little tug, make sure it is in fact locked on. Uh, last thing here on the outside is going to be your uh, secondary battery terminals. Now on the inside your battery is a Group 24 uh, deep cycle battery. It is in a sealed battery box. So what that means for you is it is not easily accessible generally. Uh, because of that, Lance was nice enough to give you some secondary battery terminals to allow you to do any battery tending, uh, check voltage, things like that, even hook up maybe a, a uh, you know, solar panel or something here on the outside. For all intents and purposes, think of these as your battery terminals um, and they'll make things a lot easier for you. Now, one thing to mention is that we include a deep cycle interstate battery with the unit. It is a lead acid battery. So at least two or three times a year, you're gonna go ahead and pull the cover or pull the battery from that sealed battery box. We're going to remove the vent panels. We're going to inspect the water level. We do want to make sure that we are maintaining that water level with distilled water. So again, two or three times a year, we're going to go ahead and do that. That's going to keep that battery in uh, good condition longer. Uh, also, utilize your battery disconnect for periods of long-term storage. We're going to go ahead and get eyes on that on the inside, and I'll probably, we'll give you a reminder of the proper uh, times to go ahead and use that. But all of those things are going to help keep your battery in, in tip-top shape, uh, especially during storage. Uh, that just about covers it here on the outside. We're going to go ahead and hop on the inside and take a look at those features. All right, so here on the inside, we're going to start talking about your remote. Uh, orientation of this remote is going to be from the rear. So if we're going ahead and we're looking at this remote, this is going to be your driver's side front, dri excuse me, driver's side front, driver's side rear, passenger side front, passenger rear. Uh, two middle buttons are going to bring the unit, uh, operate all four jacks at the same time to either bring the unit up or down. Now when we turn on the unit and pair it with the system, 
uh, we push the two middle buttons that turns on the remote and then these two top buttons go ahead and pair that with the system. Uh, and then again, so driver side front, uh, passenger side front, pass driver rear, and passenger rear. Uh, and then all at the same time. Um, other than that, if this were to run out of batteries, uh, you can easily connect this to the, uh, the unit kind of hardwired style. So in your messenger bag, uh, of goodies, you're going to find a communication cord, looks like an old, uh, old school telephone handset cord. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to remove this plug here on the side. We're then going to plug that into um, the, the corresponding plug here. And again, it looks very much like a telephone handset uh, and you will find that cord uh, on the inside of the unit. Um, don't, you don't have to worry about turning this off. It will time out after a few minutes. So we're just gonna take that and set it off to the side here. Uh, and then while, while we're here, we're gonna take a look here at the switch. Now these docking lights are going to be the bright white LED lights on the rear of the unit. Uh, those were actually on when we were doing our presentation there on the rear. Uh, this light here is going to be a courtesy light. So this is just a common, a light we can hit a known switch that we can hit coming into the unit at dark time that is going to light our way, uh, that is going to allow us to enter the unit and then go ahead and turn on uh, the rest of the lights. Uh, we have your exterior lights here. Now those are labeled on in terms of the switches there. And these are all gonna be three-way switches. So all the way down is going to be a bright white LED on all of these. If we go all the way up, that's gonna be an amber colored bug light. Uh, and then of course center is gonna be off on those switches. So it's nice to have those options uh, in terms of which lighting you want, whether that's that less intrusive amber colored light uh, or that bright uh, white LED. Uh, down low here, we have your fire extinguisher. Uh, this is part of your safety equipment. It is very important that we do test all of our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, for this appliance in particular, there's a green test tab on the top of it there. Uh, if we go ahead and push that test tab down and it springs back, that means we have life uh, within the unit. If it stays depressed, that means it's time for us to pull the unit out and replace it. So you can't recharge these. Uh, and it is important that we do that every single time. Uh, if we, we have a situation where we need our fire extinguisher, we need it to be in good working order. Uh, so coming into the unit here, uh, if we head right up top here, we have your fantastic fan. Um, this is gonna give you uh, multiple speed settings uh, to go ahead and exhaust air from the unit. Generally, the popular option to go ahead and use these is going to be opening up the side windows, uh, allowing that exhaust action to give a nice cross breeze. This fan is powerful enough to draw air from, from within, uh, from the outside. Uh, you also see a thermostat switch here. Uh, you can go ahead and dial that in uh, to a specific temperature, and then that fan's going to kick on and off to maintain that temperature. Uh, also, you have a 4 amp fuse holder there. Uh, if you have any problems with the appliance, of course, that's going to be number one thing to check. Uh, very important that you do go ahead and close the unit before going down the road. Uh, I often make the joke that it's something you only forget once because it's probably not going to be there when you get to where you're going. So uh, make sure we're closing that down. It's a very expensive fan. Uh, you don't want to have to replace it. Uh, here in the bathroom, uh, light switch for the bathroom is going to be right here. Uh, that's going to, of course, light the bathroom up. If I step in here, we can kind of start talking about some things. Alrighty, so here we have your 12-volt uh, exhaust fan. Uh, this works kind of clever. Uh, you go ahead and just, it's just push and pull. So we push up there, and then we push that red button. That's going to turn on the, uh, the fan. It's going to pull any moisture out of the air. Uh, specifically designed if you're taking a shower, uh, again, to help pull out that moisture. Uh, then when we're done using it, we turn it off and we just pull it down. Uh, of course, you have a removable uh, clothes hanger here, which again, is a pretty cool feature, efficient use of space when you're not using this as either a bathroom uh, or a shower. You can go ahead and hang your clothes here. Uh, of course, towel holder there. Uh, toilet paper holder there, uh, nice, nice to have that enclosed to, to keep it from getting wet when you're taking a shower, things like that. Uh, down low here we have your Thetford uh, uh, toilet. Uh, now this is going to use a, this is going to use a, a flush there on the side and I know that's kind of hard to see. Uh, that's going to be a light pool to fill up the bowl with water and a full pool to flush. 
Uh, very important that you do keep water in the toilet at all times. It's going to help keep those bad smells down. Uh, also very important that you do use a single ply RV grade toilet paper uh, as well as going to be a deodorizing chemical treatment as well as a tissue dissolver. Uh, it's very important that you use those properly. Uh, of course, number one, follow the, the directions on the product that you're using. But generally, you, you, you apply those products here at the toilet uh, and, and you'll, you'll chase them down with a certain amount of water uh, and you'll be good until you dump. Uh, and now, when you're storing the unit, I'm always a big fan of uh, putting a toilet treatment within the toilet even while I'm storing the unit. So uh, what that's going to do is that's going to help uh, further break down any like compounding or anything like that uh, within the tank. And, and especially, you know, it's in storage, it's, it's vacant in the sun. Uh, as gross as that sound, that's going to help with those issues uh, by keeping some water and, and some toilet treatment in the black water tank uh, while, it's, while it's being stored. I'm going to step out of here while we talk about the rest of this stuff, although there is not too terribly much here uh, within the bathroom. We, of course, have your medicine cabinet, uh, your, your uh, sink, uh, and your shower head there. Uh, sink with a diverter, uh, very standard. Just pull the, the diverter up that's going to send the uh, water to the shower head. Uh, of course, the shower head's going to have an on-off switch that's going to help you conserve water consumption. Uh, generally with these units, you're going to do a military style shower, uh, turn that water on and off as needed, uh, of course, again, to help conserve the water. Uh, lastly, we have a small compartment here uh, that's going to be your plumbing access. It's going to give us access to the water pump uh, as well as uh, water lines, P-traps, things like that in the event that they need to be maintenance. So I hope you got all that. That's a tough one. Uh, to get on film because it is it is so small. Uh, coming right over here, a ton going on here on this wall. Uh, we have your awning lights. Of course, that's the LED light strip we saw there on the outside. Uh, they put that on a lighted uh, they put that on a lighted switch uh, because if the awning is in the closed position, you can't see them. And it is a good idea uh, to have that because you know if they inadvertently get turned on. Uh, you don't want them running your battery down low or anything like that. Uh, this is a one-touch awning. So what that means for you is we go ahead and we turn the awning on. And then if we go ahead and retract the awning, we're just going to want to hit that once. That's going to go ahead and bring that awning in. Now, I'm not sure if you can see that there uh, through the window, but that awning is coming in. Uh, now, it's a one-touch awning. So if I want to stop it, I hit it in the direction I'm going. That's going to stop the awning in its tracks. Uh, if something jumps out in front of you or, or it turns out that you weren't clear to put the awning out, uh, just hit it in the direction you're growing. So we are retracting the awning. So we're going ahead and I hit it again. Now I want to, I want to bring it back in. I hit it again. That's going to start going up. One thing you want to avoid is getting really uh, kind of button happy with these one touch awnings. Uh, they work well if you're nice and patient. Hit the button once check and see what's going on. If it needs another, another, another push, then go ahead and do that. But what you want to avoid is kind of hitting it in multiple directions, multiple times. It's not really smart enough to know uh, what's actually happening, if that makes sense. So uh, I mentioned on the outside that it is equipped with wind protection. Uh, as long as this switch is in the on position, if it gets gusty out, if, if a strong gust of wind comes, uh, shakes that awning up and down violently, it's going to automatically come in. Uh, now, again, very much like that battery operated uh, door lock. This is not something that I would necessarily uh, bet my lunch on. Um, it's great to have the option. The technology is, is, is awesome, uh, but I would not rely on it. It's a very expensive awning. Uh, it goes without saying, do not leave. Um, do not leave your campsite with that awning out. Do not leave it unattended. It is, it is very important. Uh, dropping down low, we have your uh, on-demand uh, water heater control board here. Um, when I look here at this, we can see the set temperature. I can control that set temperature up or down, and I can switch between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now, operation of this is going to be a little bit different than you're used to. Uh, and, and when you're at home using your uh, shower at home, 
generally you'll turn the hot the, the, the hot water side of things is set uh, slightly higher than what's comfortable. And then you use the cold side as a mixing valve to attain a uh, comfortable temperature for you. Now you're going to want to avoid operating this in that capacity because what can happen is, is for whatever reason it can give you kind of bursts of cold water. Uh, so what, so the way you're going to operate this is it's going to take a little bit of fine tuning. You're going to dial this temperature down to a temperature that is comfortable for you only using the hot side of the spigot. That's going to give you a lot more reliable source of hot water uh, and, and of course lessen the, the amount of consumption. So, uh, and again, you're going to take, it's going to take some, some, some messing around to find that exact temperature, but that's going to work out better for you. Uh, if I drop down here, we have your uh, Dometic thermostat. Now this is going to control the air conditioner as well as the furnace. When I go ahead and turn it on, I push that button. That's going to take us into fan speed. I have to choose a fan speed before I can continue. Our choices are low, high, and auto. Now if I go to low or high, then that fan speed, that fan is going to run indefinitely, no, no matter if I'm uh, trying to put it on furnace or if I'm uh, trying to set a thermostat temperature, it's going to run indefinitely even once it reaches that temperature within the unit. Uh, to keep it right where we like it, we're going to hit auto. If I hit that again, that's going to take us into that air conditioner mode. Uh, that's noted here by the snowflake. This, uh, the fan speed is auto. We can, of course, hear that air conditioner coming on. And we have that thermostat set to 72 degrees here. Oh, excuse me. If I if I hit that one more time, that's going to take us into that furnace mode. Uh, in that furnace mode, um, once it again realizes what I'm doing, it's going to set, sh uh, shut down this air conditioner. Uh, it's going to kick on that blower motor of the furnace immediately, which is located down here under the sink. It's going to kick that on. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, generally within that you know, minute or so within uh, that operation, uh, it often sets off the smoke alarm. Now that is uh, straight from the manufacturer. That is an acceptable performance within first 15 minutes of operation. So that, uh, that is not as running as efficiently as it should. Again, within that first 15 minutes of operation, uh, as it runs a little bit longer, it's going to, that efficiency level is going to go up and it should stop setting off that smoke alarm. So if that happens, uh, just note that that is acceptable operation of the appliance. Uh, and then if I hit that one more time, it's gonna, that's going to turn the unit off. And hopping over here to your convenience center, of course, this is the water pump switch. Uh, if that red light's on, that means that the water pump is on. That's going to be what we use for um, a boondocking option. If we're drawing off of that tank, that's going to bring that water up from the tank to the fixtures and make it usable. Uh, looking here at the, the monitor panel, uh, battery is going to read full. The more lights we see, the fuller it is. Uh, battery reads full. Battery is always going to read full when you're plugged into shore power. To get a true readout of where your battery sits, go ahead and unplug from the wall, or unplug from shore power, excuse me, and then go ahead and test the levels here. Uh, fresh water is full. Uh, that's how we do our, our testing here in the shop, is we use that fresh water holding tank and that water pump to pressurize the system, make sure there's no leaks. Uh, black water is empty as it should be. Gray water is empty as it should be. Uh, again, the more light you see, the fuller uh, whatever we're testing is. Uh, here in the kitchen, not too terribly much to speak of. Uh, we have your uh, light here, um, you know, easy on off. Uh, we have your sink with the um, countertop extender there that will help you, uh, you know, give you a workable space if you're prepping a meal. Uh, we have your uh, suburban cooktop here. Uh, now this is kind of a very basic style kind of camping cook stove. Um, what that means for you is there is no sparker, igniter. Uh, you're going to have to go old school and carry a long stem barbecue lighter with the unit. Uh, what you're going to do is turn this to light. Uh, once we've done so, that propane is going to be flowing. We're going to take our, our lighter and we're going to stick our flame uh, directly on the burner until we see that, uh, that, that element fill out there. Uh, up top here, standard run-of-the-mill uh, high-point microwave. Uh, this particular one uh, does not have a turntable, which is great. You don't have to worry about that rattling, uh, potentially breaking going down the road. Uh, still going to work just the same as any other microwave you've ever used. 
Uh, you have your controls here. You have some pre preset cook modes, uh, or you can go ahead and choose a time. Very, very straightforward there. Um, up top here, we have your uh, nine volt smoke alarm. This is going to run on a nine volt battery, just like your uh, just like your smoke alarm does at home. It's very important that we do test our safety equipment every single time uh, before taking the unit out. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do so. Uh, like you would any other smoke alarm by, by pushing the button there. Uh, not a bad idea to pick a or keep a uh, spare battery with the unit uh, in the event that that starts going off in the middle of the night. Uh, that's going to allow you to go ahead and uh, change that out and avoid that scenario. Uh, up top here, we have your refrigerator. Uh, what we see here, if I go ahead and lift this panel up, is going to be your controls. Um, you have, of course, your on-off switch here. And then if I go one over to that, that's going to switch between either auto and gas into DC. So it's going to take whatever mode uh, that I'm, whatever mode that I am not in, or excuse me, whatever mode that I'm in and put it into DC. Um, and then this third button is going to do the very same thing, but between uh, gas. So it's going, if I'm in DC, it's going to take me into gas. If I'm in uh, auto or AC, it's going to uh, take me into gas. So very straightforward there. Uh, and then we have your uh, temperature control here, and that is labeled cold and coldest, and then you have your scale uh, there, uh, one through five. Uh, if I go ahead and open this up, uh, you know, nothing too crazy when we look in there. Uh, very indicative of what you would see in like a dorm style fridge. You have the fold down ice box, um, you know, just just a very you know a, just a small fridge um you know pretty straightforward stuff uh, above my head here we have the king jack antenna uh, now this corresponds with the the antenna booster plate uh, we're going to talk about that here when i hopped on to the other side uh, of the cab over here uh, but while we have this here uh, it's important to note uh, that this isn't always up antenna so what that means is that it's always up, there's no travel position, um, you're good to go. Uh, what we have here is a signal indicator. So what you do is you rotate this until uh, you get the best option in terms of signal. You're gonna know that by the lights. And then you're gonna go ahead and run a channel search on the television. Uh, that is going to bring in that best signal uh, dependent on what you have here. Uh, now we do have an on off switch here uh, on the side of the unit. Uh, what that does is that actually just turns these lights off. So uh, that's not cutting power to the unit, but if you went ahead and you and you maybe thought that those lights were intrusive while you were trying to sleep in the middle of the night, uh, you can go ahead and cut those off, um, you know, so they're not waking you up. Uh, further back here in the cab over, uh, we have your closet space. Uh, so this is just a sliding closet there. Uh, it does have a hanging rack. It would work well. We also have a secondary safety alert here, uh, another car, uh, RV uh, carbon monoxide detector and, and propane gas detector does have a test button. Uh, it is very important that we do test that uh, again every time before we take the unit out. Um, make sure everything is working properly. So your dinette here is going to make a secondary sleeping area. Uh, this one's kind of uh, not the easiest one to figure out, so we're going to go ahead and demo it. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to start by removing the tabletop from its pedestal. And these like to get wedged in there, so um, you know, do, do it as best you can. And, and it's, it's, it's um, you know, you may have to hold it uh, in place while you work that off. And these are always kind of awkward uh, because most people I know when they're sitting at a table, uh, they like to go ahead and put their elbows on it. So once you've done that, you're gonna go ahead and remove this uh, part as well. Uh, now, both of those are not gonna be used uh, for making this out into a bed. Uh, what we do use is this, this board here. So we lift this up and we take that and we put that here on the slats. You have these slats all the way around. Uh, we go ahead and put that in place. And from there, uh, we go ahead and I believe it is this side cushion here. And that's going to go ahead and make out that secondary sleeping area. Uh, now, going ahead and putting it all back, uh, of course, it's, it's what you just saw in reverse, uh, but we're going to go ahead and do it for you. 
Of course, you take this guy, you put him back down below. Uh, make sure that this is seated properly because that can really throw you for a loop uh, and actually damage, uh, do some damage. So we make sure it's seated properly and um, there, there we go. And then uh, pedestal is gonna go in. You can take this time to go ahead and buckle it in if you like. And then the tabletop uh, goes on top of that. Now, one thing I did not mention is I, I do love this tabletop because you can actually, it's on a slider. So you can uh, move it in here when you're actually uh, in the unit moving around. But if you're sitting there in the dinette, you can go ahead and bring it out here into the, the common area. Alrighty, so here in the dinette, we have a charging station here. Uh, that's gonna give you access to a couple USBs as well as a uh, 12 volt cigarette lighter style receptacle. We also have your main GFI outlet beside that. Uh, the way they wire up the receptacles in these units is they are all on one circuit. If one of them were to get overloaded, uh, this would be that reset point. So you're just gonna push that red button in. That's gonna restore function to the unit. Um, again, uh, if you don't see if that, if that green light is off, that means that it needs to be reset. And then we come over here to your uh, breaker box. And everything we see here on the left side, or excuse me, on the right side of that breaker box is going to be your uh, 110 volt resettable breakers, uh, just like you find at your house. Uh, everything on the left side of that panel is going to be an automotive blade style fuse. Now we are going to replace those, um, and it's a good idea to pick a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit, again, in the event that you do need to replace one on the road. Now in terms of function, we have everything labeled here on the door. Uh, so if you have any questions on, on what, what you uh, are, are looking at, uh, that's going to be outlined there on the door. And then down low there in the corner, we have your safety alert. Uh, that is your, going to be your, your RV uh, carbon monoxide detector as well as propane leak detector. Uh, that does have a, a test button on it. Uh, functions very much like a smoke alarm, although it is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. So there's no batteries to change. It's going to alert to you uh, which gas is it's sensing in the event that you do uh, have a leak of some sort, that's gonna tell you. And again, with any part of your safety equipment, it is very important that we do test that uh, every time we take the unit out. Uh, hopping up here uh, into the cab over, uh, we are gonna talk about uh, the, the television and the stereo. Uh, and this stuff's always kind of difficult to get uh, on camera, but if we um, if we go ahead and let me see if I can move this TV out of the way a little bit, uh, we have our antenna booster up here, uh, and this is what's going to power that King Jack antenna. Uh, there's a little button, and I know you can't see the button, but it's right above that green light. If that green light's on, that means the antenna is getting power. If that's off, that means that, that it is not. Now, if we're utilizing the, uh, the, park cable, uh, the park cable hookups there on the rear of the unit, it is very important that we uh, have that green light in the off position because they share, they share that signal. So what that means is that that's going to allow that uh, signal to go ahead and bleed through um, and allow you to utilize a park cable service. Uh, now, what we also have here is, of course, your 12-volt plug. I know you can't see that. That, that mount is in the way, but it is a 12-volt TV, uh, so you'll have access to it off-grid. We have an HDMI cable here that's actually connecting the unit to the, the Jensen unit down here. Now, this is CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, uh, HDMI arc with the television, things like that. So you can go ahead and utilize that uh, for all of those features. Um, if we go ahead and take a look here, we're gonna control each zone separate. So you have uh, two zones within the unit, one uh, set of speakers behind my back, a set of speakers above the dinette, and then a set of speakers here on the outside. So A and B, those are gonna be these, inset, these inside set of speakers, and then C is gonna be your external speakers. And again, you control your volumes of each zone separate. Uh, pay special attention to that. Make sure that you are not uh, inadvertently you know, broadcasting what you're, what you're wanting to, to listen to uh, inside here uh, to the outside. Other than that, I find most people can generally work themselves around these units. Uh, the single mode button here in the corner, that's gonna take you through your selections. 
If you want to pair Bluetooth, you just take it into Bluetooth mode, hold that pair button. Uh, of course, most people know how to do that these days. Again, very, very straightforward, very simple to, to navigate around. Uh, below that, we have a couple 110 volt all weather outlets. Uh, nothing too crazy, of course, especially if we're running like a satellite uh, receiver or something down here. That's how we would power it. Or if at some time down the road we wanted to switch to 110 volt uh, TV, we could do so. Of course, you have those outlets up there as well. That'd probably be a better option for those. Uh, and then we have a charging station here as well. Uh, a couple USBs, uh, 12 volt cigarette letter style receptacle there. Uh, going ahead, when we put this TV back in, we want to make sure that everything is lined up properly. And so what that means for us is it's going to fold up back like this. Uh, we're then going to uh, put it in fully. Uh, once we, what we're listening for is that, is that click or that, that noise. What that's telling us is that it's locked in. Uh, to unlock it, we're going to pay special attention to this ribbon here. If I go ahead and pull that ribbon, that's going to, of course, unlock the TV and allow me to go ahead and pull it back out. And again, that noise we're listening to is, is that click sound. Um, up here, we have your emergency exit window. Um, all of these windows do operate the same. So, so this is just the noted emergency exit, although you could, you could theoretically exit from any window because they are all the same window. Uh, now, operating these windows, uh, if we go ahead and open up, we're going to... Uh, open up all these latches. We would then hold the window to a designated uh, opening. We're going to tighten down those struts. It's going to keep that window open. Uh, from there, we can go ahead and pull the screen down. Again, that's going to uh, allow us to, uh, you know, get some fresh air within the unit without uh, having bugs come in. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, a nice Sunday morning, we want to sleep in, we can go ahead and pull these shades. It's not only going to give us privacy, but that's going to block out uh, some of the light. Uh, those all pull down from the top. Now, when we go ahead and bring these windows in, we do have a couple options in terms of how we close them. Uh, we have a little uh, valley on each one of these latches here. If we were to go ahead and put that, uh, that latch within that valley, that's going to give us a fingertips worth of opening uh, all the way around the unit. Uh, of course, that's, that's a good way to vent the unit, but still be relatively secure within the unit. Uh, if you have any condensation issues or anything like that, um, you know, you can go ahead and utilize that feature. Now that is only uh, to be used when stationary. Uh, when we are fully closing the window to go down the road or secure the unit, we need to come all the way back past that plastic latch and then go ahead and latch those down. Uh, above my head here, we have a, a standard exhaust fan. Uh, which you generally will see in an RV. Uh, you could feel free to upgrade to another fantastic fan in this location. Uh, that upgrade would really shine in this capacity right above the bed. But again, with any fan before we go down the road, we do need to make sure we close the vent. And, uh, you know, of course, shut it off, make sure we close the vent. Um, also here in the cab over, uh, we have reading lights. Uh, switch to turn those on and off are going to be right on the, uh, the, the unit itself. Of course, this light's going to be turned on uh, manually as well uh, with the little slider switch there on the side. Uh, I believe that just about covers it here on the inside of the Lance 650. Uh, we do hope you enjoyed the walkthrough. If you do have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you.